I am super excited to talk to you guys uh, this afternoon, this evening for most of us about something that I've spent a lot of time in and out of the military thinking about and I think doesn't really get talked about enough inside of cybersecurity circles. And that is the state of the DOD's weapon system cybersecurity. Obviously, some of these details can get into really classified territory very quickly. And so what I've done is uh, essentially restricted this talk to GAO report that came out in 2018 that I think did a really good job of balancing, conveying the gravity of this issue with also obviously protecting really important critical assets inside of the military. So everything that I'm talking about here is is available in that report and I'll, I'll link to it in the chat later. The gist of it is this, the, uh, the DOD's weapon systems are just full of digital components. As the defense industrial base started developing these things, it just became so clear that putting digital components, things like sensors and actuators and microcontrollers into weapon systems, things like aircraft, ground combat systems, satellites, uh, helps you to build more robust, more flexible, and actually more economical systems than if you try to do everything analog. And they started networking these things all over the place. But unfortunately, when, when the defense industrial base was designing these things, the requirements that were built around these systems never con contemplated cybersecurity. We sort of thought, ah, there's physical security around it. There's, you know, it's easier for someone to blow this thing up than it is for them to attack it with, a, with, with some sort of code. And that thinking accreted into like the 2000s and a lot of modern weapon systems that are getting developed have this same issue. And so disconcertingly, with some pretty simple tools and techniques, I mean, like really simple stuff, you can absolutely devastate these weapon systems, take, take over control, render them totally inoperable, and sometimes cause loss of human life. So it's a really, really big deal. Fortunately, DOD is starting to take this really seriously, and there are a number of startups and, and, and uh, some of the defense industrial-based players are paying a lot of attention to this. And so the, the purpose of this talk is to give you a little bit of an overview of what that space looks like. All right, so I'll start very quickly with, uh, I think, uh, what will probably be more or less common knowledge given the backgrounds of a lot of the folks on this call, but what is a weapon system? Well, the DoD defines weapon systems as big defense acquisition programs. We're talking about $500 million and over. You know, the court current portfolio of these weapon systems is like $1.6 trillion. And you're talking about things like, you'll notice there's some pretty old equipment on here because I didn't want to implicate any, anything that's in the current, <laughs> current inventory. But as you can imagine, these things have analogs that are in, in, in service today. Things like aircraft, maritime vessels, ground combat vehicles, communications equipment, artillery. These are all big weapon systems. And since 2012, the DOD has conducted uh, vulnerability assessments. A bunch of really crack teams have, have done cybersecurity uh, risk assessments of these weapon systems over the past 10 or so years. Um, and you might think, wow, these things are really unique. How could you possibly do cybersecurity risk assessments and distill any kind of common themes? But the crazy thing is the way these things are designed is, is actually remarkably common across, across these systems. You know, you might think a ground combat vehicle and an aircraft have totally different electronics, but in fact, there's more similarity than difference. Just to give you a little bit of a sense of what kind of functions of these weapon systems are enabled by software, uh, you know, code that runs on the digital components inside of these things. We've got, you know, we've got some pilots on the line. You're talking about pilots' oxygen levels are actually mediated by software and flying the aircraft that control surfaces on, on, on fighter jets, for example. It'd be really, really hard for a human being to control all those things. Uh, targeting missiles, turning systems on and off. And it, ultimately, cybersecurity is all about maintaining control over an asset in code, right? And so if an attacker can take, can take over control of the code that's running these subsystems, they can cause loss of, loss of the asset, loss of human life, and total degradation. So I think, weapons, I think of weapon systems uh, largely as a subclass of what a lot of people call operational technology. Uh, and it's important distinction because the, the, the kinds of systems you, you see on operational tech, technology are pretty different from uh, information technology. And it's, it's important to, to, to kind of separate those out. So IT systems, the way I think about them, they're all about manipulating information. They're all about gaining insight from, from data and information that you have and making really good business decisions, right? 
operational technology on their hand, on the other hand is there to do whatever your business is there to do right it's it's operating your actual business and so um, there's some kind of interesting differences with OT like weapon systems. For example, you've got serial data buses, these like weird protocols that are not your typical Ethernet, TCP IP, uh, UDB kinds of stacks. These are like two wires that are running throughout like your, your car, for example, uh, you, you know, uses something called a uh, controller area network or CAN. You've also got these application specific devices. So you think of a modern cell phone, it's got a full blown operating system, it's running applications. Typically the, the electronics that are on these things are way less sophisticated. They're, they're, they're reading temperature values and they're outputting particular commands in response to those temperature values, like very limited kinds of, uh, kinds of application specific devices. Let's talk a little bit about how you might attack one of these things. And again, just to emphasize, I'm highlighting only things that are in the GAO report. So while it might sound like a little cringy that these things are out in the public domain, they are. Um, and the fact of the matter is, you know, they a lot of weapon systems got caught out by um, some of these simple kinds of attacks. So, you know, the anatomy of how uh, how a nation state attacker or, or a crime war group might attack one of these things, it's pretty straightforward. You you look at uh, discovering information about the assets. So you, you try to figure out what kinds of components are in this thing. Um, can you source components for the engine that's in one of these uh, ground combat vehicles? Can you find commercially available stuff that's on eBay that's you know rolling around in, in third party? Or if you're if you're a well-funded uh, nation state, can you you know pay somebody to give you um, give you you know something have something fall off of the back of the truck? Um, you'll take those and then you'll do vulnerability research. You'll design uh, some kinds of attacks against that thing. And then ultimately you figure out your access vector. It can be iterative. You know, you have like this process where you gain access, you maybe you exfiltrate some data, you try some, some, some attacks out to make sure that you're in the right ballpark. And then you, uh, and then you learn more and you, and you iterate on it. And the defense sequence is, is pretty straightforward. It's just like it is in the IT side. You know, you prevent limit attempt, uh, you know, you prevent or try to limit attempts to subvert all the typical, you know, security triad, the confidentiality, integrity, availability of the system. And you try to control, you try to design your sec uh, security control measures so that they work together. And it's all about defense in depth, right? The GAO report has this comical graphic. It looks kind of vaguely like a uh, somewhere between a stealth uh, stealth bomber and like a Star Trek symbol, but it's it's a hypothetical weapon system for cl classification purposes. And this just gives you a sense of just how many systems are on these on these weapon systems that require electronic control. And you know it's it's tough building the the requirements for these things. But typically, you know, the requirements are evaluated on program cost, schedule, performance, readiness, these sorts of things. But the responsibility for cybersecurity is spread across all those components. And it's the responsibility of all the authorizing officials to see like that the program is adhering to it overall with the security controls. And, and that's a really, really tough job. So here are some factors that are increasing the risk of these systems. You've got uh, computerized network nature of these systems. They're constantly communicating with each other. There's been this huge drive to have weapon systems communicating with one another so that you can increase awareness and effectiveness of, of the individuals in the network. You know, it's a huge force multiplier. It makes them really robust. But the cost is obviously huge cybersecurity risk. You know, these things are heavily dependent on software and on IT. And historically, you know, the DOD has been pretty focused on IT cybersecurity, and I would argue it does a, a really good job. But relatively speaking, you know, the OT side does, just, just doesn't. And so you see all kinds of subsystems on here, and you can imagine that if I can gain control of any of these things, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty devastating what I can do to the system. Okay, so that's cool. You know, we have the payload idea of what can you do to this thing once you have access, but... Um, how do you how do you get access? You know, this is this is really the security thesis for for decades is that oh, there's there's no way to get access to these systems. And if you can't get access to the systems, there's there's no there's no vulnerabilities. Well, it turns out these things are really connected. First thing is obviously RF. So this is a, a little bit of a hard attack vector. But um, I we have seen plenty of firmware on RF transceivers that is not good. And you know, there are vulnerabilities out there where you can pivot through RF. You've got operators' personal electronics. I mean, this is one of the favorite ones, right? Like people bring iPads and 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 iPhones up and, and aircrafts and all sorts of things like that. And you know, who knows what they're doing on the open internet with those personal devices and potentially pivoting through that. They get plugged into some sort of power source or whatever. There's all kinds of access vectors there. 
Supply chain is a huge issue. But ultimately, this is a really difficult problem. You got hundreds of components that go into modern systems. And then maintenance ports are, are one of our favorites. So, you know, you, you might have a totally secure system, but the maintainer is going around with this clunky old laptop that he probably had plugged into, you know, into Nippernet or, or, or God forbid, the internet. And, uh, you know, they're, they're going around plugging into all these multi million dollar weapon systems to do diagnostics. And that's by way, you know, trusted root access onto that system. So as you can imagine, you guys are all, you know, security professionals. The, 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 once you peel, peel the onion back here on the access vectors, it definitely makes you cry. Uh, and then finally, you know, these things are embedded heavily in, in, um, in networks. And so there's, you know, like I said, huge benefit to the weapon systems and the warfighters, but the networks themselves can be vulnerable. So if the weapon system sitting on a network that's compromised, you know, that's a, that's a really big problem. And, and of course, this isn't theoretical. We saw like think solar winds. I mean, you know, there are certainly examples of persistent threats that have existed on, on, on DOD networks for, for, for a long time. Uh, and, and obviously one of the things you do is you pivot around. And so if you put weapon systems on, on the Doden, for example, uh, or on, you know, classified networks, you're, you're potentially exposing them to some, some pretty, pretty big problems. And, you know, GAO, of course, uh, rightly pointed out that they've been sounding the alarm on this since basically the early nineties. Uh, so this will make your eyes bleed, but this is the, uh, this is the DOD's acquisition process. Um, and, Ultimately, like what gets put into weapon systems is really uh, a result in, in, in a big way of like how acquisitions are designed. Most of these current weapon systems have no high level cybersecurity requirements once, once they were written. And, you know, changing these requirements is really, really difficult once, once a program's uh, set in record. And then, you know, something that I face every day is bolting cybersecurity onto these things later in stages of development is, is way more difficult and costly um, than designing them in from first principles. And, you know, when you connect these newer systems to older systems, it's still vulnerable. So you've got, you know, like the weakest link in the chain is what's going to be bite you in the end. Look, I think things are getting better here. Cybersecurity requirements are definitely changing. You, you look at systems like the optionally manned fighting vehicle, for example, and that has you know robust cybersecurity requirements written in. So ultimately, people are listening, but the thing is these, these legacy weapon, weapon systems aren't going anywhere. They're gonna be around for decades and decades. A lot of my compatriots uh, in Cyber Command did these cybersecurity risk assessments. And you know, look, we we found vulnerabilities in basically every system that we went up against. I mean, it was it was not a question of if, it was a question of how, you know, how many hours was it gonna take for us to just completely subvert the system? And then how many of these just devastating vulnerabilities could we could we rack up? And it's this isn't bespoke stuff. Like I would love to pretend like we're a bunch of, you know really elite hackers that found these just bespoke O days that are that are really, really tough. And, and um, you know, someday pe people are going to write write theses about uh, how incredibly ingenious we are. But <clears throat> it's just not the case. Like there's really simple tools and techniques, like just dumb stuff like default usernames and passwords, no encryption. Um, I mean, like we easily took control of so many of these things. You're talking about two person teams taking hours. Um, you know, simple stuff like remote access, copying, changing, deleting data. Uh, we could manipulate what the operators were seeing. I mean, it, really, really bad stuff. The, the other thing is sometimes program offices would put security controls in place, but a lot of it is how they're used, right? I mean, you have to consider these things as a cohesive whole. And one of the examples that the GAO report calls out is, you know, there was a system that had RBAC, uh, you know, uh, role-based access control, but the, 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 the communications on the bus were unencrypted. So, so it was like, sure, you can authenticate and everything, but like the passwords were just going in plain text across the wire, right? And this is like an architectural design flaw. You, you, you've, got, you've got layers of issues here. Uh, another really disconcerting thing that um, uh, we, we saw was that operators of these systems are just anybody who's spent time in, you know, in a motor pool, uh, this will totally ring a bell. But, you know, unexplained crashes are basically the norm for the system. And so there were examples of where like the red teamers would go up and do an attack, like just denial of service on the thing. And the operators, it just what it never seemed abnormal to them. They would just continue restarting the system and saying, oh, yeah, that looks like it's on the fritz again today. Um, and, and that obviously uh, creates a really, really bad environment for, for fixing these, these vulnerabilities.
ultimately the duty has like limited insight because of the way these penetration tests are doing. We're just reporting on the low hanging fruit. And, and what's really necessary is like a much more comprehensive approach. Uh, but I don't wanna be a security nihilist. Um, I think things are definitely getting better. Uh, you know, um, even just this year in the NDAA 2021, uh, section 1712, uh, is, is continued uh, the funding for establishing the, the, the cyber vulnerabilities of major weapon systems. It created like a, a strategic cybersecurity program, uh, improving systems and critical infrastructure, kill chains, all these sorts of things. So I think there's a lot of awareness around this issue. Things are definitely getting better. You know, we got a DOD cyber strategy. There's this test and evaluation guidebook you see here, which is really helpful in standardizing how we're penetration testing these systems. Um, ultimately, I think there are some deeper challenges, something that uh, I wrote this article about in War on the Rocks about retaining cybersecurity talent in, in, uh, in, in the DOD. Uh, I think there are some much deeper challenges that we're, we're starting to get better with, but ultimately we're only going to succeed in making these weapon systems more secure if we're able to retain top talent in uniform. Uh, and then finally, just figuring out the, the information sharing issues, like there's, there's limited insight into a lot of these systems because of classification issues problems at obtaining like the details of the attacks, cross pro program information. So one program office talking to another uh, and ultimately these system operators uh, can't even like dig into cybersecurity vulnerabilities without without clearances. So, you know, I think on balance, we're definitely in a better place na now than we were five or even 10 years ago, uh, but we've, we've really got a long way to go.